Welcome to Renegade Inc, the talk show which allows us to think differently. When the novelist John le Carre acknowledges and thanks somebody for his example demonstrating the perils of speaking a delicate truth to power, we get really interested. When that person is a former British diplomat and vocal critic of the Iraq war, it's important to hear their thoughts. Fearing the professional consequences of an account that was so critical of the government, Khan Ross anonymously submitted evidence to the Butler inquiry in 2004 and directly contradicted the official line that there was no alternative to war. Shortly after, he resigned. As a man who put right before might and morality before the national interest, what can be learned from his progressive approach to foreign policy? The 2003 invasion of Iraq is still an unresolved issue in the hearts and minds of the British people. George W. Bush, the then American president, was hell-bent on the invasion and the then British Prime Minister, one Tony Blair, unconditionally supported his plans. Khan Ross was a foreign office diplomat on the fast track to ambassadorship and almost certainly a knighthood. But in 2004, Khan went renegade. He turned his back on power and status and went on to set up Independent Diplomat. We went to his headquarters in New York to catch up with him. I began by asking, what goes through your mind when you're about to publicly contradict the official government narrative? I think one of the myths of whistleblowers is that, that there's this kind of black and white binary decision. Um, and for a long time, I'd been very, very concerned about what the government was saying about WMD and Iraq which in fact I had worked on. So it was a question of facts and lies. And I did, it wasn't you know, just my feelings about the war. And the Butler inquiry gave me and others who'd worked on Iraq the opportunity to offer testimony. As I was writing out my testimony, I just thought I can't go on. What my testimony said is deeply, deeply critical of the government and that has to be the end of it. When you were writing it, do you understand the ramifications? You must have understood, you must have had a, a, an inkling. No. No, I didn't. I'd written the evidence many times before, actually, as resignation letters that I'd never sent. But I wrote the evidence, sent it off to Butler, and I remember the moment of pressing the send button on my word processor, as we called them then. <laughs> and uh, I was in Kosovo at the time and thinking, this action is some kind of ending, uh, but I don't quite know what. And three days later, I sent my evidence as my resignation letter to the Foreign Secretary without really knowing what would follow at all. What was the reaction to that? Uh, he did not reply. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a short while later, I got an email from the personnel department in the Foreign Office uh, offering me psychological counselling. The irony. <laughs> I, I declined the offer. Tonight, British servicemen and women are engaged from air, land and sea. Their mission? To remove Saddam Hussein from power and disarm Iraq of its weapons of mass destruction. The then British Prime Minister, Mr Blair, you obviously uh, totally contradicted him. Mm. He must have a, a, you must have a visceral reaction to that man. Visceral is the word, yes. Uh, yeah, I feel very, very strongly about it. I feel he, he's responsible for a great many deaths, um, including people I know, um, and has not really been held accountable for it. I don't think a public inquiry, however much it contradicts um, his own account of what happened, is sufficient accountability. I think he should be prosecuted for what he did. He should face material consequences. This was a war. When um, you begin to think back then, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, a lot of the evidence uh, and justifications used to go into those countries, mm. fundamentally false. How do people gather evidence and pitch it in a way that allow a, a hierarchical government to make those decisions to go in and cause all that collateral damage. How do you begin to start putting that campaign of lies together? Well, I know about Iraq. I, d I don't actually think the, the justification for Afghanistan was a lie. I mean, it was very clear it was about self-defence. I actually agreed with that justification. In fact, I delivered the letter from Britain to the UN claiming uh, that the seeking authority for the invasion, I guess you'd call it, uh, under Article 51 of the UN Charter Self-Defence against Al-Qaeda and the government that had uh, facilitated Al-Qaeda, the Taliban. Iraq was more complicated. I think there was a lot of groupthink inside the Foreign Office, but after 9-11 it became very clear from the top down that the government wanted a particular account, the Prime Minister wanted a, a particular account of the threat, and the evidence was massaged to fit 
that prerogative. It wasn't the other way around. We didn't look at the evidence and produce an, an analysis that Iraq's WMD was a threat because, in fact, we had been doing that for many years and had come to the conclusion that Iraq's WMD was not a threat. So the impulse to change that story came from the top. Mr Blair once said uh, in a media interview, it was a throwaway line, he said, you know, once um, you distance yourself from, from America, it's a long way back. Do you think that that influenced his foreign policy? Absolutely. I mean, he was a lapdog. He was a poodle. Um, you know, everything was about America. I worked on the Middle East with the British Foreign Office for many, many years, and there was a very clear transition during the Blair years. We used to go to Washington to talk about Iraq and the Middle East to offer our, our own views about what the policy should be, you know, Britain's own independent analysis and recommendations. But after a while, and towards the end in particular, after 9-11, it just came, became that we went there to receive our instructions, to be told uh, what to do. No, I mean, Blair was, it's a kind of weird thing, he was in sort of awe of the Americans. I think he wanted to be an American. And that lack of uh, moral fibre, you could call it, that lack of leadership, that lack of independence of thought, it creates a huge vacuum, does it not? Because even the people around him, Parliament, British Parliament, don't have any leverage to try and move him towards a position which is reasonable because ultimately decisions have been made and that's the end of the story. Well, I think that underestimates the potential of Parliament and indeed the press. I think the opposition and those who opposed the war in both Parliament and the press utterly failed and they could have done a much better job. I think that in the press and in Parliament and in the political debate, quote unquote, um, a degree of generality is permitted and encouraged that is not conducive to proper accountability and critiquing of government policy. The facts on Iraq's WMD were in fact out there. It's quite a detailed story. The, the British government had put out facts about the Iraqi WMD issue that contradicted its own later account. So if you assembled those facts and those different versions of the truth that the government had put out, you could, you could mount a very, very compelling attack on the policy. But I, nobody ever did that. It was always about lie or not lie. It was always done in sort of hysterical, emotional terms. And, you know, the greatest evidence of this was the, the uh, David Kelly scandal, which was all about did the government exaggerate or not? Well, if you looked at the facts of the matter and what we ourselves had for many years said, you could come to very almost empirical conclusions and that account would be devastating. Did you know David Kelly? I did. I worked with him for many years on WMD. We gave presentations to the UN Security Council experts on Iraq on many occasions. What sort of guy was he? Uh, he was very professional, very diligent, uh, quiet, meticulous, a scientist. Uh, he was very impressive. He was very authoritative. He was probably the world's leading expert on biological weapons, which was his speciality. But he was one of the only people uh, among the weapons inspectors and the WMD experts who could stitch together the whole quite complicated picture of Iraq's WMD into a coherent account of what was going on on the so-called different files, which was biological, chemical weapons and, and ballistic missiles. Those were the three types of WMD that Iraq was prohibited from having, having plus nuclear weapons, of course. Coincidentally or otherwise, Dr. Kelly had predicted his own death. He'd once said, I will probably be found dead in the woods. Within days of this appearance at the committee, that's exactly what happened. When you heard of his death, what was your immediate reaction to that? You know, I was stunned by it, to be honest. Uh, it took me a long time to absorb what it meant. Um, I don't know why he killed himself. Uh, that's, you know, uh, between him and his maker and perhaps his family. Um, but the circumstances of the political scandal were very, very familiar to me um, because I too had been talking off the record to the press about the government's exaggerations of the case for WMD. So it felt very close to me and it was an, an appalling tragedy because he was a, a decent man. When you begin to look today, post, obviously post Iraq, post Afghanistan, at the Middle East, what do you see? Well, an epic disaster basically. Iraq is, is a disaster. I'm not saying Saddam Hussein was uh, a good thing and I'm glad that he was overthrown and I was very, very opposed to his regime. But the aftermath of the invasion has been a disaster for Iraq of endless chaos, which has itself then fostered further. ISIS was born of the Iraq uh, chaos. It was born in prisons, in American prisons, uh, uh, holding uh, Ba'athist activists who became extremists, who became ISIS. So there's a very clear line between the chaos in Iraq and the, the, 
broader threat uh, of ISIS, which is now, of course, a global threat. One way of looking at what happened in Iraq was the Allies went in to destroy a, a fake threat and created a real one uh, that threatens everybody now worldwide. More broadly in the Middle East, there are more complex phenomena at play of democracy and autocracy, uh, uh, you know, and it's wrong to create single narrative threads through it. When you think about that Western influence, <clears throat> really to a layman, or to the insider and the professional, the statesman, the diplomat, it's very difficult to identify a coherent strategy that the West has had on the Middle East. Almost all of it, from my view anyway, has been ad hoc responses to short-term pressures. Yeah. How do you begin to stop that short-termism and actually sit down and create some kind of strategy where the West can gen genuinely help as opposed to go in and either loot the place for political game, regime change, or whatever else it might be. No, I think you're absolutely right. It's always been short term. It's always been um, self-interested. It's always been, um, you know, very much conditioned by the circumstances of the time, um, and you know, has been free of any basic sense of values. Um, you know, the West has supported autocrat after autocrat, repressive government after repressive government, and continues to do so today. And the grossest example being the West's support for Saudi Arabia and its grotesque and bloody war in Yemen, which is causing you know, appalling civilian casualties. How do you stop that? Well, you start to pin, underpin your foreign policy with real values. Uh, and this should be a global norm, and not just in the Middle East, but you support democracy and those fighting for democracy. You support human rights. It's not that complicated. You know, we turn foreign policy into this fantastically complicated kind of chess game. But actually, if you are guided by basic normative values, you know, your foreign policy choices become pretty simple. What are those values? Human rights, democracy, um, you know, saving human life. Uh, it's, yeah. it's not complicated than basic, simple human values that Western governments claim to adhere to, but uh, very often, particularly in the Middle East, do not. But let's just stop off at Saudi Arabia for a second. Um, Wahhabism, if I have the right pronunciation, mm -hmm. what's your view on that? I'm not an expert on it, um, so I don't really have a view on it. Um, I do know that Saudi Arabia has you know, incubated the extremism that became Al-Qaeda. Uh, a great many of the hijackers that took part in the 9-11 attacks were of course Saudi. And it's often forgotten that their motivation for the 9-11 attacks was actually to get at Saudi Arabia through the US. This narrative that uh, you know, our civilization is under assault from these people, that they hate the West. Uh, if you actually read the suicide notes of the hijackers, that's not what they say. Uh, what they say is they want to get at the corrupt regime which controls Islam's holy places and that they have uh, uh, allowed this foreign power, this um, heathen power, the Americans, to desecrate these places by uh, occupying uh, Saudi Arabia with, with their military forces. That's the yeah. argument that, in fact, some of the hijackers make in the things that they've written. You barely ever hear it. I've you never didn't heard hear it at the time. You don't, but you haven't no. heard it since. No. Why? Because after 9-11, a narrative was created of what it was about that was different from what it was really about. And the press? have been handmaidens to that, obviously. Absolutely handmaidens to that. The press is guided by government. This, this, this idea that there's this independent estate that is holding government to account is, I think, a, a fantasy. You know, government has enormous power. We're seeing it very manifest in, in the Trump presidency where they're very shameless in the way they pick out journalists and say, we're going to talk to you and not you, and depicting the press as, as ultimately hostile. I don't actually think that's true. I think in many ways the press reflects the priorities of government, reflects the agenda of government. Um, only rarely does the press really engage in proper investigation of what's truly going on under the surface. And I think that's become more difficult for the press as resources have become thinner for deep investigative journalism. Welcome back to Renegade Inc, the show that allows us to think differently. Before we talk more with independent diplomat founder Khan Ross, let's have a quick look at this week's Renegade Inc index. We start with our favourite tweets. First up is from Matai. The last thing the Syrian war is about currently is Syria. 
Next up is from History in Pictures, and this is a picture of Baghdad, Iraq in 1965. And this one is from Gareth Watkins, who says, uh, Do you think that George W. Bush constantly paints pictures of soldiers who died in Iraq so Satan can't use that for his ironic punishment? Fairly punchy, Gareth, but uh, we know what you're getting at. And finally, from Rakhia Chamsuddin, who reminds us, This is not normal, after reading the headline, George W. Bush discovers his inner Rembrandt in homage to veterans. If he's uh, discovered his inner Rembrandt, the likelihood is many Iraqis have found their inner Jackson Pollock when they're thinking about him. Our book of the week this week is Creating Freedom by Raul Martinez. Raul argues for a more compassionate, understanding society. The book analyzes how imbalances of power, justice, and wealth are maintained and questions how we all contribute to them. His premise is that neoliberalism is not natural law, but has become a belief system, an ideology, what one might even consider a horrendous religion. He claims our faith in free media, free markets, free elections, and free will is dangerously misplaced. The message is that society needs to be urgently restructured and reimagined in more cooperative and inclusive ways. Martinez makes it clear that there are a variety of solutions available, but it's the will to act that's crucial. Now back to New York for more with Khan Ross. After resigning from government after contradicting the official line on the UK's notorious Iraq invasion, he set up Independent Diplomat, an organisation that gives countries independent advice on foreign policy. I wanted to get his view about the crisis that Western democracy faces now and if there are any reasons to be hopeful. But I started by asking him, how do you go about reforming a sclerotic and dated organisation like the United Nations? I think the, the problems are painted in a way that makes them seem insoluble when in fact they are perfectly soluble. And I say this to every diplomat I meet who comes to the UN all dewy-eyed and hopeful that they can reform the system. Well, I say there's actually a very simple way to do it, which is reform the way people are appointed into the system, make sure that people are only in the system on the basis of merit and promoted on the basis of merit. And unfortunately, that has never been the case. Uh, that would transform the UN bureaucracy at a stroke if that were actually the managing principle of how that place operates. Of course, transparency would help, real accountability for UN officials. There have been a number of horrific scandals recently of uh, sexual abuse by peacekeepers where there's been no accountability for those involved, all the senior officials in the UN who should have investigated it and sorted it out. Even they, too, have escaped accountability for their utter failure to do so. Uh, it's very, very distressing. I think if you sorted out the people in the UN, you would actually go a long way to fixing the problem. People claim it's all political, you know, it's financial, the US, a lot of finger pointing at the US, which I actually think is not necessarily justified. How do you solve the people problem at the UN? The theory at the moment is that um, we have a new and tough and independent Secretary General in the body of Antonio Guterres, mm. who was appointed in a rather new and transparent way. The power was to a degree shifted from the permanent five members of the UN Security Council to a broader mandate from the General Assembly. And the uh, candidates for the job were subjected to hearings in the General Assembly. And he emerged from that as the leading candidate in a way that made it very difficult for the P5 to stop him. That's an optimistic and, aspect. Yeah, uh, and if you applied the same techniques uh, to other aspects of how the UN uh, is managed, I think you could achieve a lot. But it requires a lot of guts. It's not that complicated. Guts and coherence and drive are not qualities associated uh, with diplomats. You know, they tend to be much more cautious. Uh, for good reason. So it's often an uphill battle persuading people that these reforms are actually relatively simple if groups of countries would form up and express some determination and use some tactics to get these outcomes. I don't think it's impossible. What's your view on Ban Ki-moon's tenure? I think he was a decent man. I think on some things he was important and successful. Climate change is the big one. He really made an effort for that and of course during his tenure we saw the Paris Treaty uh, which was a very important milestone in global efforts to control global warming. It's not enough and it wasn't just him who achieved it. There are many reasons um, including our own work dare I say but that stands out as the big milestone achievement of his tenure. But I think you know, he was not the le leader that the UN needed during that period. I don't think it's easy to be leader of the UN. And I think his predecessor set a tone of kind of accommodation with the leading powers rather than leading them. I would like to see a Secretary General who says very clearly, we need this, this and this to stop the war in Syria. I dare you to disagree with me.
here's my plan for stopping the war in Syria. The Secretary General should be focusing on saving life. That's got to be a very, very clear mandate. Unfortunately, that mandate is often obscured in all the yada yarn talk, talk, talk about the UN. How do you see developed nations and broadly the West now? How, how would you depict it? I don't know. I mean, I think there's often been periods of turmoil, um, democratic turmoil, economic turmoil. You look at the Great Depression. I mean, the human suffering that was immense in the 1930s across Europe and in, and in the US. And I don't think we're at that point yet. What we're at is a kind of crisis of democracy, of illegitimacy, of governing institutions, um, and a lack of clarity about the way forward uh, that is exacerbated by profound inequality, where a very small group of people are taking all the, all the benefits of the economy. Uh, most people are feeling left out, and that's creating itself enormous political pressure. The unaccountability of elites is something that you have written a lot about and thought mm -hmm. about. Um, have they ever been this unaccountable in the West? Yeah, I think they'd be mostly unaccountable. I, I think, you know, most of the time, supposedly democratic government has not been very democratic. And I think you can see a growing a trend where uh, supposedly democratic governments have become ever more divorced from the collective wishes of the general population, as much as those can be defined. I don't think uh, government, even if you call it representative government by a very small group of people over the mass, can ever be properly accountable or transparent. Is government broken? Yes, absolutely. I mean, people don't believe in institutions. They've lost trust in government. Politicians are widely hated. Uh, even politicians have to hate politics in order to get elected. The institutions of democracy are in real trouble um, and the attempts to re-legitimise them by politicians are, are totally inadequate. How do you begin to solve that? Bring democracy back to the people, involve them in democratic decisions, have government for the people because it's by the people. Direct democracy is one way of describing it. Uh, Localise your decision making as much as possible, then only aggregate upwards when you have to. A confederation of smaller uh, democratic bodies governing from the grassroots upwards that involve everybody. So everybody who has a stake in a decision is somehow part of that decision. It sounds utopian, but actually it's totally doable. We are used to contracting out our democratic responsibilities but to government. But that's been a total disaster. Well, it's been a disaster and it's been you know, one of the problems. I think we have to take our democratic responsibilities seriously. And that means engagement directly with each other about the issues that concern us. And inevitably that takes time. It's not just a change of the institutions, it's a cultural change on how we look at each other, that no longer can we just blame them you know, up there in government for all of our problems, they become our problems. That kind of complacency comes in to the uh, national psyche, um, and I want to try and link this to consumerism and ultimately debt. Mm -hmm. When you build a, a society on a credit driven economy or build some, anything on credit, mm. um, everybody involved in that system thinks that somebody else is looking after it. Mm. Do you see a link or is that too simplistic? I think the link is that everybody feels trapped by the economic system in some weird way. Although it's supposed to liberate us and make us all richer, I think everybody feels trapped in that they often have to service debt themselves or take on debt in order to have the lifestyle they wish, or at least a certain level of wealth which requires you to work, often in jobs you don't particularly like. There's this kind of you know, endless mouse wheel that you can't seem to escape from. I mean, how do you step off the economic system and actually choose not to take part? That doesn't really seem to be an option for most of us. And in that sense, I think that has very much reinforced a political system that is, requires our non-participation, that excludes us from decision-making. I think everybody's very busy trying to get by. That's the hamster wheel, right? Yeah. That's the treadmill. Yeah. The opinion poll has been a very damaging um, facet of leadership, I'd say broadly. You, in your book, Leaderless Revolution, quote W.B. Yeats' poem, Second Coming, and there's two lines in it. The first is, the best lack or conviction, whilst the worst are full of passionate intensity. Yeah. The celebrity politics that we see, it couldn't be depicted better, could it? No, of course. I mean, look at who, who is demonstrating the most passionate intensity today. It's Trump and his supporters, and, you know, undoubtedly he's the worst. A lot of us are really smart. I'm really smart. Went to the Wharton School of Finance, even then, a long time ago, like the hardest or one of the hardest schools to get into. Did well at the school, came out, made a fortune, wrote a book called The Art of the Deal. Did everybody read The Art of the Deal? One of the challenges for people who are liberal, who believe in eclecticism and tolerance, 
is finding the passion that seems to drive those who are more certain, who are more fascistic in their instincts. I'm a passionate liberal, I'm a passionate, uh, passionate eclecticist cosmopolitan, I believe in the rights of the other as equal to my own. I think actually though, now that those values are under threat, you'll see a lot of people uh, re uh, rediscovering the passion. As a liberal, neoliberalism hasn't really served very well and in Yeats' poem he also talks about the centre not being able to hold mm. and this is what we're seeing now and you can't divorce that from the economic system that we no, have. No, I absolutely agree. Um, so as a liberal and you have this neoliberalism, mm. <laughs> they're mutually exclusive. We've got to be careful about terms here. I, I mean liberal in the sense of tolerant. I don't mean um, I'm a neoliberal in my economics. Uh, my economics and my politics are, are consistent in that I believe that a political decision should be shared by everybody affected and I believe that all economic enterprises should be shared by all those who benefit. Um, above all the workers, I believe in the cooperative model. So this is not a neoliberal model. I don't really believe in the idea of profit over everything at all. I think our main objectives as human beings are not profit actually, it's not economic growth. We have other better things about us and I would like to see a political e an economic system that celebrated and advanced those things, compassion, solidarity, community, meaning. These are the things that matter most to people and we don't have a political and economic system that celebrates those things or promotes those things. But it's possible. Even though we've been over all this territory and it seems a lot of it's doom and gloom, and, and you, you seem um, very optimistic, even though pragmatic and realistic. Um, hopeful about the future? I don't know. I mean, I have mixed feelings about it. I think, you know, recent developments have been very, very worrying. And I'm as upset about the rise of the far right as anybody. But I do think that more radical ideas uh, of how to fix our economic and political dispensation are becoming more widely accepted. My own ideas about making anarchism relevant for the 21st century, it's not just me, but the people who think like me are getting more of an audience than they used to. In that sense, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic about young people. I think they're generally anti-partisan. I think they're pragmatic in the way that they approach their politics and economics. I think they are worried about the future, but also prepared to take the practical steps to address it rather than just relying on politicians. So in that sense, I'm optimistic. Congratulations on Independent Diplomat. Thank you. How long now? 12 years. Good fun? Sometimes, most of the time. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thanks a lot.